today I'm going to be running through an installation of Gentoo. I did a Gentoo installation video probably about three or four years ago, and I haven't actually installed Gentoo myself personally on any of my equipment probably in nearly two years probably. So it's been a while for me. So today I wanted to actually do a Gentoo installation and record it on camera for you guys because I have been getting people asking me to do this kind of video. And I think a lot of people are asking about it because they're curious about the install process for Gentoo. Many people have this misconception that the Gentoo installation process is really, really hard, really, really difficult. And it's actually not hard at all. Those of you, if you've ever installed Arch Linux, for example, you know, the Arch install and the Gentoo installation process are practically the same. You do a lot of the same commands. The only difference is some of these commands, once they have to execute, take a lot longer in Gentoo, right? Especially installing software because Gentoo is not a binary distribution like Arch Linux and, and most other Linux distributions that you guys know about. Gentoo is a source-based distribution. So when it's installing software, it has to compile the software. And that takes a long time. The installation process for Gen 2 can take a few hours. It could even take a couple of days on really old hardware. So it's lengthy, the process of installing Gen 2, but it's really not hard at all. Now, I do have to consider that Gen 2, you know, to install it in a timely fashion so it doesn't take all day, you know, I need to do it on a machine that has some beefy specs. The only machine that I have that's halfway decent as far as the specs on it is my main production workstation here at this desk. The only problem is that, you know, recording video and editing video and streaming and things like that, you know, doing this kind of work that I do on this YouTube channel also requires a beefy machine. And I, again, I only have the one machine, so I can't install Gentoo on this machine and also record it using this machine. So what I'm going to have to do today is I'm going to install Gentoo inside a virtual machine. But don't worry, uh, every time I, I do one of these Arch installs or Gentoo installs inside a virtual machine, I get people asking, hey, man, could you do it on real hardware? Because they think the process is different. The process, the commands you enter are exactly the same. So don't worry that I'm doing this in a virtual machine. The installation process, I promise you, is exactly the same. I've installed Gen 2 on physical hardware, just like I'm going to install it inside a virtual machine. I've installed Arch you know, in, in virtual machines and on physical hardware. The commands I enter are exactly the same. You guys, if this is your first time installing Gen 2, I also strongly suggest Installing it in a virtual machine first, you know, installing it in something like VirtualBox just to practice before you actually try to do it like on a, a main production machine because you may screw up, right? And because the installation process is such a lengthy process, it's better to practice a few times in a virtual machine before you actually uh, you know, format the drive on your main production machine and then, you know, you mess up the installation process two or three times and you're without a computer for a couple of days. So do this inside a virtual machine if this is your first Gen 2 installation. So let's go ahead and get started. The very first thing you want to do is you want to pull up the Gen 2 handbook. So the handbook is basically your installation guide. The installation guide, first of all, the very first thing you want to do is select your CPU architecture for almost everybody that's going to be AMD 64. That's your standard x86-64 processor. There were uh, other architectures available, such as ARM. They even had a uh, RISC-V, and there's even some old PowerPC uh, stuff there. But for most people, what you want to do is get the Gen 2 AMD 64 handbook. So let's go ahead and get into the installation. Installing Gen 2. Now, some of this I'm going to skip because some of it is covering really basic stuff, like the very first chapter here about the Gen 2 Linux installation that introduces you to, you know, some of what you're about to get into with installing Gen 2. I'm not going to bother reading that. If you guys want to read it, go ahead and check that out. Choosing the right installation medium. I'm not going to cover this either. This is, uh, you know, how are you actually going to install it? I'm telling you right now, I'm going to go grab one of the ISOs from the Gen Gen 2 downloads page. I'm going to grab a stage 3 ISO. That's what most Gen 2 users probably do is a stage 3 installation. This page here also covers how to verify the ISO as far as checking the checksum. I'm not going to do that here on camera. I also am not going to cover how to burn the ISO to a USB stick. I hope you guys know how to download an ISO and burn it to a USB stick. If, if that seems like 
you you, you need help with that, then please just stop with the Gen 2 installation right now. You're not, you're not ready for it. The next chapter is configuring the network. Now I will open this just in case I need it. We may not need it, but this is for setting up the network, the ethernet connection. I'm going to be on a wired connection. I know some of you guys are probably going to do this on a laptop. You're going to need Wi-Fi. Understand that I'm going to install Gen 2 for my machine. So I'm going to do, you know, certain things that maybe aren't going to be what you need on your particular hardware. Just understand that don't copy me. You know, if you're doing this on a virtual machine, it's fine to do exactly what I do. If you're doing this on physical hardware, then some of the commands I enter, you need to enter different commands. So don't blindly follow this video. Actually read the handbook and make sure you're doing what you need to do for your particular hardware. Now let me switch over to my desktop. This is the virtual machine I created. I gave this VM uh, six threads of my 24 thread thread ripper so that's plenty for the vm to work with it should install gen 2 rather quickly for us i gave it 12 gigs of ram typically what you want is however many cpus you give a vm you want to give it twice that much of ram and let me go ahead and start the vm and we get a, a boot prompt if i don't do anything it's going to try to boot off the disk we haven't installed anything so there's nothing to actually uh, boot into so i'm just going to hit enter and we get into a TTY prompt, uh, essentially a live environment. It's just a TTY prompt. First, we need to load the key map. If I don't hit anything in the next few seconds, it automatically defaults to US key map. Uh, 43 was the number of the US key map if I needed to enter the number. And then we get to this prompt here. Now, if I go back to the handbook, you can read a little bit about how to check your IP address, check to see if the network is working. I'm not going to read uh, all of this to you guys. If you guys want to check this out, go ahead and read it. Uh, I just want to verify that networking is working. And if it is, then we can move on to the next thing. So if I run this command here, ping, and I'll just ping google.com. And I'm getting, you know, output return. It's actually hitting google.com. So networking is working. Control C will kill the ping. If you just wanted to give it a number of pings to do, I could do a dash C for count three and then google.com and it will ping Google exactly three times and then I don't have to bother doing the control C to kill the ping. Now the next part of the installation process is probably the most important part of installing any operating system really is preparing the disks. So this is setting up your partitions. Now I strongly urge you guys, I know I skipped you know the first three chapters essentially <laughs> in the handbook, but you, I, you can get away with that. I strongly recommend though that you read this. So really pay attention to preparing your disk. You need to decide whether you're gonna do a legacy boot or UEFI. So we're talking about master boot record versus you know GPT. And if you don't know what that is, again, read this page. I'm gonna do legacy boot in this VM, uh, but it's really the commands for installing uh, legacy boot or UEFI are, are practically the same. They're just some minor differences. I may mention those differences as I go through the installation process. If I scroll down the page, you get an example of a, a default partition scheme. You should create three partitions, at least according to them. And you don't have to do this, but this is just what they recommend. You should do a boot partition, a swap partition, and then, of course, your main partition for your data. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. And they recommend using the F disk utility or parted. Those are two command line utilities you can use to set up your partitions. I'm not actually that familiar with either F disk or parted. I usually use a program called CF disk. But for this video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use F disk because since that's what the Gen 2 handbook recommends, I want to follow the handbook as closely as possible. I don't want to veer away from it because then, you know, you guys might be a little confused about what I'm doing. So the first thing I need is the name of this device because it's not going to be SDA the way it is in the handbook. In this virtual machine, it's typically VDA. But if I run this command, LSBLK for list block, you will see that my drive is VDA. So that is the actual device. So I want to do F disk slash dev slash VDA. And then I don't know the F disk commands because I, I don't run F disk that often. So it tells you to hit M for help. That's what I'm going to do. And then it gives you all the commands for F disk here. And it looks like we need to create a new partition table. Now, do I want to do a DOS partition table for master boot record or do I want to do GPT for the uh, UEFI? I'm going to do the DOS partition table. So I'm going to hit O and then enter. 
and it said created a new DOS disk label with disk identifier, yada, yada, yada. Now let's go ahead and add our partitions. N adds a new partition, so I'm going to do N. And then is it primary or extended? It's going to be primary. And then what is the partition number one through four for legacy boot? If you're doing UEFI, you have potentially up to 128 partitions you could choose from. We're going to do partition one here. The first sector, just hit enter and let the first sector be the first sector. And then the last sector, you could give it a number. But what I like to do is just do plus and then however big you want to make it. This is that boot partition that they recommended in the handbook and they recommended 256 megs. So do plus 256 capital M for the last sector. And that created a partition one of type Linux, the size 256 megabytes. Great. Now let's do N for new partition, uh, primary partition. And this time it's going to be partition two. And the first sector, once again, just hit enter. And then the last sector, how big do we want to make? This will be our swap. Uh, I'm going to make this only one gigabytes here in the VM because the swap partition is kind of wasted space in the small VM. If I make a huge swap partition, I'm not going to have enough disk space to actually do the installation. But I did want to create a swap on camera. It'll just be a small one gigabyte swap partition created new partition type of type Linux size one gigabyte. We will have to change the partition type for the swap because it needs to be type swap instead of type Linux. But we'll get to that in just a second. One more time, let's do in for partition and then primary and then the partition number. This time will be three. And then the first sector, just hit enter for the default. And then the last sector, we want it to take up all the remaining space on the disk. So this time just hit enter. All right, now let's change the partition type of that swap, especially. So hit M for help. And let me see, type T to change a partition type. So let me hit T on the keyboard. And then what partition number are we changing to was the swap. And that's the one I want to change. And then the hex code or the alias. I could type L to get a full listing of all the available types. And uh, swap is 82. See, aliases, Linux is 83, swap is 82. And that's the only ones we really need. Uh, I'm going to do 82, of course, for this swap partition. All right, and then M for help one more time. Now, one thing we didn't do, we haven't made anything bootable yet, so let's hit A to toggle a bootable flag. What partition needs to be bootable? Well, partition 1 obviously needs to be bootable. That was our boot partition. And if everything we've done is correct so far, right now I think we could just write the table to the disk and exit. So just type W for write, hit enter, and that should be all we need to do with FDisk and setting up our partitions. Now let's get back into the documentation. Now we've got to talk about creating our file system. Now the file system, I'm going to go with extend for. That's typically what I go with. You guys want to install anything else, you know, ButterFS or XFS or Riser or whatever file system you want to put on the machine. You do you. You just read the documentation. For me, I'm going to do extend for. So I need to run the command mkfs.extend for. That's make file system extend for. So let me switch back over to the desktop here and let's go ahead and start making these. Now they recommended doing extend two for the boot partition. That's kind of the old school Linux way. Uh, extend four would also work for the boot partition, but since they recommend doing extend two, so let's do MKFS dot extend two space and then slash dev slash VDA one is the first partition on the virtual machine on physical hardware. Typically this is going to be SDA one, but here because it's a virtual disc, you know, they call it uh, VDA one. Let's write that. All right. And now we've made that file system. Now let's make the swap. So MK swap is the command to make a swap slash dev slash VDA two was the swap partition. And we've just created the swap. Now let's actually turn the swap on. So do swap on and then slash dev slash VDA2. And now finally, let's make the extend for partition on the third partition. So MKFS dot extend for space and then slash dev slash VDA3. And now that we've created that third partition, especially, you know, we got that extend for partition, we need to actually mount that because that's where yeah, everything we do from here on needs to actually be placed on that particular partition. So let's mount slash dev slash VDA3. And then I'm going to space and then where am I mounting it to? I'm going to do slash mount slash gen2 and hit enter. 
And let's get back into the install guide in the handbook. The next chapter is installing stage three. So I mentioned we were going to do a stage three installation. Now, uh, what do you need to do is you actually need to, from the command line, go and download the stage three tarball. Uh, before that, though, they also talk about setting up date and time. You typically won't need to do this uh, if the date is correct. So if I type date, let me verify that that's actually, yeah, that's correct on my system, but they do in the handbook discuss how to change that, that time and date if for some reason it is needed. So let's go ahead and download the stage three tarball. So the first thing we need to do is we need to CD into slash mount slash gen two. So let's go ahead and do that. CD slash MNT slash gen two. I'll just tab complete. And then what the handbook recommends is downloading the path to the stage three URL using the command line download utility wget. Now that's great except uh, getting that very lengthy URL and name of the ISO. It's, it's not a, a small <laughs> a path to that ISO, right? So you could use wget, but what I strongly recommend is what they talk about next is using one of the terminal browsers like Lynx, L-I-N-K-S, or Lynx, L-Y-N-X, uh, both fine terminal web browsers. And I'm going to actually use Lynx. We'll use uh, Lynx, L-I-N-K-S for this because it makes downloading stuff very easy. So I'm going to go in here. I'm going to type Lynx space and then HTTPS colon slash slash Gentoo.org slash downloads, I believe, will actually get us to the download section here. And just click OK here. And then with the arrow keys, just go down and that one right there. Stage 3 Open RC. I'm going to use the Open RC init system. Those of you that want to do a System D installation would choose the System D install. But there's the documentation for the most part is mostly built around using the Open RC init system. That's the traditional init system that Gentoo has always used. So that's what I'm going to do for purposes of this video. So I'm going to hit enter on the Stage 3 Open RC. And then it's going to ask me, do I want to save this? Yes. And it's asking, do I want to download it? OK. And it's going to download it right here in the browser. And once this bar has reached 100%, we will hit Q to quit out of the Lynx browser. Let me Q to quit out of Lynx now that we've downloaded that. And we downloaded it right here in the directory we're in, which is slash MNT slash Gen2. The next thing we need to do, that was a, a compressed tarball, right? We need to unpack that tarball. And how you do that is entering this very lengthy command here. Make sure you add the correct flags at the end of it as well. So let me switch back over. And I'm going to type the command tar. And then the flags are XPVF space. And then just type ST and then tab complete. And that's the stage three tarball we just downloaded using the links browser. And then space. And then these flags dash dash XATTRS dash include equals and then in single quotes we need to do asterisk period asterisk then the ending single quote and then space and one more flag dash dash numeric dash owner and if we did that right let me verify that looks good and hit enter and it's going to unpack that tarball this is going to take a few minutes and unpacking the tarball took about five or ten minutes. And the next part of the installation is configuring the compile options. So this is the flags. So this is our make flags. Uh, it gives an example of the make.conf and the safe flags here. This link here, if I remember correctly, this is actually pretty useful because depending on your CPU architecture, you know, for me, I'm I've got the uh, Threadripper, so I'm going to do the Ryzen. Uh, the Threadripper I've got is model 1920, so the 1000 and 2000 series. It tells me exactly, you know, the flags that I may want to do in the make.conf. So let me switch over and go ahead and open the slash Etsy slash portage slash make.conf. Is Vim installed? I don't think it is. Yeah, so Vim is definitely not installed. So I can't do Vim. It's VI, I'm pretty sure is it here. So let's do VI slash Etsy slash portage slash make dot comp. So VI is here. If you guys wanted to use Nano, I know Nano is also available for you. I'm going to go down to this line here, common flags here, and I'm going to edit this line because uh, going back to 
a page, my particular CPU architecture, it tells me to make this dash O2 space dash March equals ZNVER1 space dash pipe. So what I need to do is in between dash 02 and dash pipe, I need to go ahead and add dash M arch equals ZNVER1. And then the last thing I need to do is the documentation did mention one other thing that you probably want to do is you want to tell uh, the config file here how many cores to use make ops equals dash j2 that would be what you would use for I guess a two core processor now I gave this machine six cores right or six threads but it, the virtual machine treats them as cores so I'm gonna go in here and I'll just add this to the end of this document here so I'm just gonna create a new line and I'm gonna do make ops equals and then inside double quotes dash lowercase j and then the number that I gave this so six cores there then I'm gonna hit escape and then I'm gonna write and quit and then let's get back into the documentation and let's click on the next chapter which is installing the base system so this is where some of the magic really starts happening first we need to uh, get our mirrors and we, we want the fastest mirrors obviously to download the software so I'm going to enter this mirror select command here let me get back into the desktop and I'm going to type mirror select and then space dash I space dash O space and then two greater than signs uh, and that's very important it's two of them because we're going to add to a an existing file here we're going to write to it slash mount slash let me make sure I got the path right slash chin to slash Etsy slash portage and then make.comp so all right so we get a in curses menu where we can select the mirrors that we want to add to the make.comp for me I'm gonna add mirrors in the US which I believe it's alphabetical by country so let me go toward the end here and I'm just going to go ahead and hit the space bar on each USA mirror I don't know if I need them all but that's plenty let me go ahead and hit OK the next thing we need to do is uh, the Gentoo eBuild repository. We need to make a directory and then we need to copy some stuff over to that directory. So the first thing we need to do is a make directory. So mkdir space dash dash parent. So give it the parents flag and then space slash mnt slash Gentoo slash Etsy slash portage slash repos dot com. Let me make sure I spell that because it's a new directory. I couldn't tab complete it. Let me. Yeah, repos.conf is the name. And then what we want to do is copy, so cp space, and then that same path we just typed, so slash mnt slash gen2 slash etsy slash portage slash repos.conf space. And then what we want to copy that to is slash mnt slash uh, gen2 slash etsy slash portage slash repos.conf slash gen2.conf. You'll have to type that and hit enter and it says cp r not specified so what happened here is i typed something wrong so let me verify the page here i got ahead of myself here and copy uh, i i thought these paths were the same the copy path but it's not you see instead of uh, mount gen2 etsy portage it's mount gen2 user share portage all right so let me fix that so i'm going to go back in here and instead of mnt slash gen2 slash etsy mnt slash gen2 slash user slash share slash portage slash and then there's one more directory config slash repos all right so let me make sure that's right slash mnt slash gen2 slash user slash share slash portage slash config slash repos dot com all right and then we're copying to mnt gen2 etsy portage repos.com gen2.com all right so this command should work now all right no errors were returned to verify that worked what we should really do is actually make sure that this file that we were writing to that something was actually written to it so if i did a cat on slash mnt gen2 etsy portage repos.com gen2.com yeah so it did write something to it and getting back into the handbook the next thing is copy dns info so looks like we just need to do this command here, this copy command. So I'm going to do cp space dash dash d reference 
space and then slash Etsy slash resolve can't tab complete. No, it does tab complete. So resolve dot conf space and then slash MNT slash Gen2 slash Etsy and hit enter. And then the next part of the installation is mounting the necessary file systems. There's these five commands you have to enter. You do need to actually enter these correctly. And this is probably one of the more uh, tedious commands to, you know, as far as you know, you got some typing to do here. So I've, let me just go ahead and get this done here. So I'm going to do mount space dash dash types space proc space. And then what are we uh, doing this? We're doing this as a slash proc space and then slash MNT slash Gentoo slash proc. So uh, again, that would be something very easy to mistype or misread, you know, but I'm pretty sure I got that right that time. So then the next command is mount space dash dash R bind space and then slash sys and then space slash mnt slash gentoo slash sys and then mount space dash dash make dash r slave space and then slash mnt slash gentoo slash sys once again then mount space dash dash r bind uh r bind space slash dev this time space slash mnt slash gentoo slash dev and then last one mount space dash dash make dash or slave space slash mnt slash gentoo slash dev then getting back into the handbook here it says if we were installing this on a non-installation uh, media non-gentoo installation media so you were installing this from inside another linux distribution you may have to do this here in the red box i i'm doing this from the official gentoo installation media so i'm just going to skip that but you guys again you know you may be doing things a little differently than i i, I can't do everything possible with a gentoo installation on a single video just know that if you deviate in any way read the handbook and finally, we need to chirrut into the new environment. So we need to chirrut into the new mounted file system. And that's where, of course, everything's going to get compiled and installed to and everything. So this is very important here. So let's go ahead and do chirrut space slash MNT slash Gen2 and then space and then slash bin slash bash, of course, the bash shell. And then we need to source the Etsy profile and then finally they recommend this here I, I this isn't really needed what they're doing here but you want to change the prompt so export ps1 ps1 is your shell prompt and then what they recommend is uh, doing the word cheroot inside parentheses space and then your standard ps1 prompt so and then the ending double quotes there and you see all that does is just change the prompt instead of live CD and then the path. And now it's true live CD and then the path. So that just lets us know, you know, the prompt gives us confirmation that we're actually in the true environment. And the next part of the installation is mounting the boot partition. So this is very easy. So let's go ahead and mount space and slash dev. They say SDA1, but remember in my virtual machine here, it's the disk is actually VDA one for the partition space and then slash boot and then finally configuring portage portage is gentoo's package manager uh, the command line interface to portage is a utility called emerge and installing a gentoo ebuild repository snapshot from the web emerge dash web rsync I, I this is kind of optional i think I, I think i could skip this if i wanted to but just for sake of you know, being on the safe side, I'm going to go ahead and run the emerge dash web or sync and go ahead and let that go ahead and sync to the repositories here. This probably will take a few minutes, so I'm going to step away, make a cup of coffee. I'll be back when this is done. And the emerge uh, web or sync has finished. The next thing that we need to do in the handbook, it says, uh, yeah, after running you know, emerge, you may get some e select news. This is important messages from the gen 2 teams it could be critical messages about things you need to know i i usually just skip this <laughs> but if you actually want to read the e-select news you type e-select news and then read and it's gonna list the messages 
of course it's all going to scroll by a better way to do that would have been to do uh, e-select news list i believe would have just yeah gave you the overview of the messages and there were six messages so it gives you the title of each one and the next thing we need to do is choose our right profile so uh, e-select profile list and let's make sure that we actually do this correctly this is another thing that you want to make sure you get this right because there's a lot of different uh, profiles you could choose and depending on whether you want to do 32-bit libraries or strictly 64-bit. If you only wanted 64-bit only, then obviously the, one of the profiles you need, it needs to include the word no multi-lib. Uh, also, we've got uh, things like MUSL, for those of you that would rather do MUSL than uh, GLibC, I guess. Uh, I, I wouldn't recommend that unless you really know what you're doing. We've got some System D stuff. Of course, we're doing OpenRC. The default profile is number one, and it looks like it's already selected because that's why it's got the blue asterisk. But if you needed to select a different one, you would do E select profile and then set and then the number. So if I was changing from profile one to profile two, for example, I would, you know, E select profile set two, but for me one is fine. It's already set, but I could select it again. And getting back to the handbook, the next step is updating the world list. I know this step usually takes a while. You have to enter this command here: emerge uh, dash dash ask etc etc. Uh, updating the world set. What is the world set? Well, we could click on the Gentoo wiki link for world set, and it explains world set encompasses the system set and the selected set. And the system set contains the software packages required for a standard Gen 2 installation. So obviously we need that. And the selected set contains packages the admin has explicitly installed. So let's go ahead and uh, update the world set. So let me switch over to the desktop and I'm gonna type emerge space dash dash as space dash dash verbose space dash dash update space dash dash deep space dash dash new use space at world hit enter and uh, obviously uh, because again it's a source based distribution there's going to be a few things that it's going to have to update here install or update actually it's just a few things five but i think this process usually takes a little while so i'm going to pause the recording i'll be back once this is completed And updating the world set finally finished. I, I did remember that that took a long time, and I was correct. That took almost an hour <laughs> to, to do that. The next thing, configuring the use variable. So this is some of our use flags. And if you wanted to see what use flags are already in use, let me go ahead and enter this command. Emerge dash dash info. And then what you want to do is pipe that into grep. And then we want to do the caret symbol that symbolizes the beginning of a line and then all caps use. So it's going to find a line that starts with use and then you have use equals and then a whole bunch of flags here. So that is all the use flags. If you wanted to edit that, you could. You could actually edit the make.conf. I'm not going to do that. I'm not really interested in playing with the flags. If you wanted to see what the flags actually are as far as the description, you could use the less command. And then what you want to do is take a look at slash var slash db slash repos slash gen2 slash profiles slash use dot d e s c and that will pipe all of the flags into list just hit enter to, to get the list to go down but you can see for example if you had the also flag that adds support for media libraries and also libraries you know just hit enter to go down and read the entire list q to quit out of lists and the next thing in the handbook is configuring the accept license variable. They say it's optional. So it's what kind of license do we want to accept as far as installing our software? Do we want only GPL compatible software or only FSF approved or OSI approved, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, since they say this is optional, I'm assuming I could skip this step uh, if I really wanted to, though I probably would accept probably the most liberal set of licenses just to, to cover all bases so I didn't run into a situation where I was trying to install something but couldn't.
Scrolling down even further, we get optional using system D as the init system, and they say the remainder of the Gen 2 handbook focuses on OpenRC, and this is the reason I'm doing the OpenRC installation is because it focuses really on OpenRC. If you want to do system D, the documentation is kind of sparse, right? <laughs> well, so moving on, time zone. So we probably need to go ahead and set up a time zone. So let me go ahead and do an ls, and I'm going to do an ls in user share zone info. And if I do an ls, you see you get a listing of the possible regions. So this, if you've ever done a graphical installation of Ubuntu or anything that uses like the Calamaris installer, for example, you know, typically it sets the time zone sometimes automatically for you. Typically, you know, I'll just click on the little world map and choose America slash Chicago. Well, where is that graphical installer getting that information? Well, it's getting it from user share zone info, you know, this particular uh, directory here. And I see America in the list. So if I did a LS on user share zone info, America, you know, did a LS in that, you see Chicago in the list. And so that's exactly what I want to set my zone to America slash Chicago. So how you do that is you need to echo. And in my case, America slash Chicago, and that needs to be wrapped in quotes and then space and then a single greater than sign. And then we're going to write that to slash Etsy slash time zone. And then we need to emerge space dash dash config space sys dash libs slash time zone dash data. And that emerged very quickly. So that was just updating the local time to now reflect, in my case, America slash Chicago. Now, I'm not actually in Chicago. You guys know the southern accent. I'm actually in Louisiana, but Chicago is the central time zone. Louisiana is the central time zone. So that's why I always just choose Chicago out of the list. And the next step is configuring our locale. So we need to open the slash Etsy slash locale dot gen. So let me go ahead and do that. And that they you were using nano. I'll just use VI since it's here. Actually, because emerge is already set up, I probably could go ahead and just emerge Vim. And I'm looking through the Gen2 wiki for Vim, and Vim is app dash editors slash Vim. Well, let me just go ahead and do that. Let me do an emerge and then app dash editors slash vim just to get me a, a better text editor. I'm not that comfortable with VI and I can't use nano at all. So let's just go ahead and get vim installed. So Vim finally finished installing. That took uh, about half an hour to install. Was it worth it? Well, for me, I was eventually going to install Vim no matter what anyway. If you guys don't use Vim, obviously, you don't need to do that. Now back to configuring our locales. Now, if you're not sure what locale you need to choose, you can check it out in user share internationalization supported. So uh, let me go ahead and show you guys that if I wanted to run this through less, let's do less and then slash uh, user share. Now, that was internationalization. That's I 18 N where 18 signifies there's 18 letters in between I and N. It's just a short form for internationalization and then supported. And there are all the locales again, piping it through less, just hit enter to go down. Of course, you could pipe it into grip if you wanted to search for a specific locale. Obviously, I'm going to do uh, English US here and they actually already have the codes for English US here. So let me go ahead and I'm going to open this in Vim. So I'm going to Vim slash Etsy slash locale dot gen. And they already have c.utf8 here. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, leave that, but I'm going to add English US ISO-8859-1 and then add English underscore US dot UTF-8. You need to have at least one UTF-8 uh, locale specified. Some things just need that. So I'm going to go ahead and write and quit. And back to the browser here. And the next thing you need to do is run the command locale dash gen. So let's do that locale dash gen. Generating three locales because that's how many locales were in the file that we added. And going back to the handbook, if you want to see the available locales, you could always type eselect locale list. So I could do eselect locale list. 
And there were the locales. The default one right now is set to seven. Now, if I wanted to change that, I could do e select locale set. And then let's do uh, English US UTF 8. So I'll set number six. Now we need to resource our slash Etsy slash profile for that change to take immediate effect. And it gives you the command to type. You need to type period space and then slash Etsy slash profile. Unfortunately, doing that, it. Uh, ruined our uh, Chirrut prompt. I mean, we're still Chirruted, but it set the PS1 prompt back to its default form. Uh, if I wanted to, I could take the time to put that back. So let's export PS1 equals. And do you guys remember what it recommended? It was Chirrut inside parentheses. It could be anything. It's just the main thing is changing the font to something different uh, just so you know that you're actually Chirruted. And going back to the handbook, uh, now reload the environment with env-update and and source the Etsy profile and and export. <laughs> the pro okay, so I actually uh, ended up doing basically this, not this exact command, but we already took care of that. If I had actually read the rest of the page, <laughs> I would have just run that command there. So let's go ahead and click on configuring the kernel. So first we need to choose an appropriate kernel source and install it using a merge. So I'm just going to type that first command there and emerge space dash dash ask space and we're going to install sys dash kernel slash gentoo dash sources and I'm just going to click enter for yes this may take a few minutes to install all right and the uh, gentoo kernel sources installed that took about 20 minutes so uh, not terribly quick but not terribly long and when I give the times of course that's particular for this virtual machine I created those of you that have even better beefier machines you know these things may install quite a bit quicker those of you that are trying to install Gen 2 on a potato this could take hours and hours right so all right so the next thing we need to do after the uh, emerge of the Gen 2 sources let's do an ls-l user source Linux just to verify that it created a symbolic link and I do apologize guys if you hear the train going by here there's a train track not too far from this office here and user source Linux is what we needed no such file or directory so let's go back into the documentation it looks like we need to do a e-select kernel list and then choose a kernel so I don't know why they gave the ls command before that because yeah because I mean, it's obviously not going to return anything until we actually choose something from the list available symlink targets so then run e-select kernel set and obviously there's only one target available so set number one says can't load module kernel I misspelled kernel instead I typed kernet <laughs> so okay e select kernel set one all right and now let me up arrow back to uh, ls dash l user source Linux and now that sim link has been created and finally the moment everyone's been waiting for kernel configuration and compilation now, uh, the handbook here, the Gentoo handbook says, manually configuring a kernel is often seen as the most difficult procedure a Linux user ever has to perform. Nothing is less true, okay? So it's hard, but you know what? It's really not hard. So, uh, and, and if you want to actually do this, we need to do, install the PCI utils. So we need to emerge sys-app slash PCI utils. So let's go ahead and do that. So emerge space dash dash ask space and then sys dash apps slash PCI utils and hit enter. All right, and now that the PCI utils are installed, the next thing we need to do is CD into user source Linux. Remember that uh, that was created for us. So CD into user source Linux. And then we need to run this command, make space menu config. And this should launch an incurses program where we can configure the kernel manually. And this is typically not something I do, but they do have some good information here in the wiki for those of you that want to configure the kernel. Um, some things that you may want to enable or disable, things like dev tempfs support, SCSI disk support, 
um, selecting necessary file systems depending on what file system you're using. Typically, I don't care to go through and manually configure you know every module in the kernel that I want. Typically, I just installed the big kernel, the generic kernel, so that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to merge sys-kernel slash gen kernel. So let me get back over here. And then, you know, again, if you guys want to configure your own kernel, I mean, you can go through the menu and hit enter and tick on and tick off things. What I'm going to do, though, is I'm just going to exit out of this. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to merge space dash dash ask space sys dash kernel slash gen kernel. And we're just going to install the big generic kernel. And I get some errors here. So let's read the errors. It says, uh, Sys kernel Linux firmware, so something is wrong with installing Linux dash firmware. Saying something about redistributable license. So if I get back into the handbook here and go back, you remember the licenses that I said were optional because it does say optional, configuring the accept license variable and we didn't set one. Uh, one of them was redistributable, binary dash redistributable. And I've actually got some notes here. This is not in the Gen 2 handbook. But I've done a search for this in the past and I've got some personal notes here on what I need to do to fix this problem. Apparently I've had it before. I need to echo and, and then in double quotes, sys dash kernel slash Linux dash firmware, because that's the, the program that's having a problem. It's because we didn't accept a binary dash redistributable license. So let's go ahead and do the at symbol and then all caps binary dash redistributable make sure I spelled that right yeah and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pipe that into this command line utility called T T takes standard input so it's gonna take that echo command and it's going to uh, write that to a file and I just noticed I didn't do the ending double quotes there let me do that okay then pipe that into T dash a to append a file meaning add this as a line at the end of the file don't overwrite the entire file with this with this echo and this needs to write that to slash etsy slash portage slash package dot license and of course the package dot license file i had to type the whole thing in because we never created it in the first place so and now that we've done that you get the output here you know in the command line but it also wrote the output to slash etsy slash portage slash package dot license and now that should allow us to up arrow and then emerge again the gen kernel and it should allow it yep no more licensing issues now installing the kernel is going to take a while i'm expecting with the system resources that i gave this vm it might do it in a half hour maybe it takes up to an hour i don't know what i'm going to do is i've been at this computer now uh, going on about four hours. <laughs> so I'm going to step away. I'm going to actually go out to lunch and I'll probably be back before this big generic kernel has finished compiling. Guys, it's been two hours since I had started the compilation of the generic kernel so I actually canceled uh, it compiling because I think it, it hung up it didn't look like the virtual machine was using any CPU so I think uh, the emerging of the gen kernel had reached a point where it was just frozen it wasn't doing anything and it had already been two hours <laughs> passed by and it's been nearly six hours since I actually started the whole installation process so what I did is I went ahead and hit control C and cancel the compilation of the gen kernel and I went ahead and installed the uh, gen 2 dash kernel dash bin package that is a binary uh, of the gen 2 kernel so hopefully that will install correctly hopefully it'll go a little faster I found that by the way in the gen 2 handbook uh, this was the gen kernel I scroll down there were some alternate uh, distribution kernels that we could install including uh, gen 2 dash kernel and gen 2 dash kernel dash bin so dash bin i'm assuming it's a binary it should maybe install quicker we'll see all right so the gen 2 dash kernel dash bin kernel actually installed in about uh, 25 minutes so a uh, much quicker installation than the gen kernel trying to compile i really think the gen kernel probably compiles a lot quicker than two hours i really think that for whatever reason 
the whole process just froze up because after two hours, uh, I, I've never had a kernel take that long to compile, especially since I gave this VM plenty of resources to work with. Now, since I installed one of these alternate distribution kernels, uh, it says post install and upgrade. So every time there's a kernel upgrade, I need to run this command here, which is a merge dash dash ask at module dash rebuild to rebuild the kernel modules. All right, so moving on, let's get past all of this. Finally, installing the firmware emerge dash dash as sys dash kernel slash Linux dash firmware. I think we already installed that though uh, earlier because that was the uh, the package that had a problem with the licenses that you know it wanted to force us to agree to that binary redistributable license. But just to make sure, I'm gonna do emerge space dash dash ask sys dash kernel slash Linux dash firmware just to make sure it's here it said would you like to merge these packages it didn't tell me it was already installed so I'm just gonna go ahead and emerge it again might as well I mean we've been at this install now nearly six and a half seven hours <laughs> and that really took about one minute to install the Linux dash firmware package now let's move on to configuring the system and this is about the F stab. So this is the file system table. So it asks us to do nano slash Etsy FS tab. Uh, does it give an example of what the FS tab should look like? Yeah, here's an example, Etsy FS tab example. And this is using uh, MBR. So that is a good example for me to follow there. So let me get back over into the VM and I'm going to do vim space slash etsy slash fs tab. Fs tab stands for file system table. So I'm going to go down here and clean some of this up. Uh, first thing we need to do is actually just uncomment all of these. Now, if I wanted to use the labels, I think I could. If I wanted to specify specific partitions, for example, instead of label equals boot, I could actually change this to actually the name of the drive or the uh, path to the drive. So I could change this to slash dev slash VDA1 was the, uh, the boot partition. And if I wanted to do the big partition the same way, let's just get rid of UUID and I'll do slash dev slash VDA3 was that partition. The swap was of course slash dev slash VDA2. And then let's go ahead and uncomment slash dev slash CD-ROM for the optical drive, even though I won't be using that really in this VM. Uh, one thing I noticed in the example FS tab here is they assumed that uh, the slash boot file system here was extend 4. And of course, we did make that. Uh, I believe we made that extend 2, so I better change that. And then let me write and quit here. So do colon WQ here in Vim. And the next thing we need to do is the networking information, host and domain information. So we need to set a host name at slash etsy slash conf dot d slash host name. So this is very simple here. So in your text editor, nano, or in my case, vim, open up slash etsy slash conf dot d slash host name. And host name is set to localhost. Obviously change that to anything you want. I'm going to name this particular machine. I'm going to call it vert dash gentoo. Just a nice descriptive name, especially if I ever SSH into this VM, I'll actually know exactly what it is because of the host name vert dash gentoo tells me it's my gentoo VM. And going back to the handbook, next thing it talks about is the slash etsy slash comp dot d slash net file. It doesn't exist by default and it says uh, if a domain name is needed, then we set that file. We don't actually need that, though. So I'm just going to skip that for now. I don't think we need to play with that. Let's go down to configuring the network, and we need to install some network utilities. So we need to run this command, this emerge command. So let me go back here, and let me clear the screen here so you guys can better read what I'm typing here. Emerge space dash dash ask space dash dash no replace space net dash misc miscellaneous slash net ifrc. And that installed very quickly. And back to the handbook. It talks about the uh, conf.d slash net file again. 
I don't know. Maybe we actually do need that. We're going to be using DHCP. I'm going to be using that, of course, for Ethernet. And it mentions adding that line to Etsy conf.d slash net. So just in case that is needed, I don't see what it would hurt for us to actually go into that. So I'm going to vim slash Etsy slash conf.d slash net. And of course, that file it was an empty file, meaning we just created it. So the line I wanted to add, according to the handbook, is config underscore eth zero equals DHCP. Then I'm going to escape colon WQ to write and quit. Now, eth zero, uh, we need to make sure that that is actually the uh, interface here. So I'm going to do IPA and make sure, yes, it is actually eth zero. And back to the handbook. Now we need to make sure that networking automatically starts when we reboot. So cd into slash etsy slash init.d. So cd into slash etsy slash init.d. And then we need to create this symbolic link here well, using this command ln space dash s. So we're creating a symbolic link for net.lo space net dot eth zero and then we need to make sure that this starts this service this networking service starts every time we reboot we need to uh, make this happen with openrc so we need to run this openrc command rc dash update space add space net dot by tab complete eth zero and then space and then the word default can i tab complete that no i have to type it all the way out and it says added net.eth0 to run level default. Moving on, we need to uh, edit our slash etsy slash host file. And they give an example of what one might look like. Um, th these are actually pretty simple. It looks more complicated than it is. So open in your editor slash etsy slash host. And for me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down here and it's already got... 127.0.0.1 localhost. That looks pretty good. I'm also going to add the uh, the host name for this computer. So I'm just going to do vert dash gentoo and then tab over. And we'll also leave localhost here. And then colon colon one. I'm just going to do the same thing. So let's go ahead and add the host name for this computer. So vert dash gentoo. And we'll also leave localhost in this file. And that's really all I'm going to do in slash etsy slash host. All right, and we're getting really close to being able to reboot into our freshly installed Gentoo now, but we need to set a root password. So we need to obviously run the passwd command. So passwd, and of course we're logged in as the root user, so this will be the root password. Now Gentoo requires you to create a strong and complicated password. It has to be 8 to 40 characters, it can't use dictionary words, and uh, it would be advisable to use a mixture of upper and lower case letters. So let me type a strong and complicated password. I hope I remember this password, I think I will. Alright, so we've created the root password. The last three things here, I don't really think I need to play with those. Uh, one is editing slash etsy slash rc.conf. That's the open RC, uh, it's like startup services. And if, if I really needed to play with the init system, I could play with that file. I don't need to do that. Then it talks about slash etsy slash conf.d slash key maps for our key map. It's already set to a US key map, so I don't really need to go back in there and play with that file. And then HW clock is the clock. Make sure it's set to local. I guess just to make sure that that is the case, I could vim slash etsy slash conf dot d slash hw clock. Now it's actually set to clock equals utc. If I wanted to, I could set it to local. Note that you, if you dual boot with Windows, then you should set it to local. This is not a dual boot machine, so I'm good on that. So let's get back to the handbook and then installing tools. So this is your system logger, installing a system logger, that's very important. So let me go ahead and get to the desktop here. And I'm probably just going to install the first one that they recommend, which is called sysklogd. So emerge space dash dash ask space app dash admin slash sysklogd. And now that sysklogd has been installed, the next thing we need to do is actually make sure that that auto starts every time we log in. Again, once again, we have to use OpenRC here. So let's do RC 
dash update space add sys klog d and then default and sys klog d added to run level default and back to the handbook this is optional but on most linux systems you probably want to add a cron daemon and they uh, advise you to install crony and then of course register that with OpenRC. I'm actually going to skip this because in this VM I'm not going to be uh, setting up any kind of cron jobs or anything. You could also add uh, mlocate which that allows you to use the locate command to find files and directories on your system. I'm fine just using the find command which is just a part of the standard GNU core util so I don't need mlocate. SSH, you may want to install the SSH server on your system if you plan to SSH into the machine. Right now, I don't need to add that, but if you need to add that to your OpenRC startup services, then of course you need to do that once again with the rc-update add command. Then it mentions you may want to install some file system tools. So depending on what file system you used, in my case I used Extend4, there's some extra tools that, that come along with that file system that you may find useful. In my case, I need to install sys-fs slash e2fs progs. And I will do that because I think that is actually very important to do. I'm going to do a, an emerge dash dash ask and sys-fs slash e2fs progs and hit yes to that and the next thing is installing network tools uh, mainly we need a DHCP client so we actually have a working internet when we reboot so we need to go ahead and emerge DHCP CD so let me go ahead and do that emerge space dash dash ask space net dash misc slash DHCP CD and that's finished installing. Next, after DHPCD, optional, uh, we could install PPP if that is used to connect to the internet. I don't need that. You also could install WPA supplicant. That's needed for Wi-Fi. This is strictly Ethernet, so all, all I really needed was DHCP in my case. So I'm going to go ahead to the next chapter, which is configuring the bootloader. And of course, this is going to be uh, about installing grub the first thing we need to do is emerge grub 2 so let me go ahead and do that let me clear the screen here if i can type correctly and i'm going to do an emerge dash dash ask space dash dash verbose because i guess we want to actually see the output from what's going on with this command sys dash boot slash grub colon 2 and I'm going to answer yes to that question. Now, while that is emerging, I should mention that I am doing master boot record, and that is actually what that command is for. Those of you that wanted to do a EFI boot, I mentioned I, I'd mention this when we got to it. Is the differences? The difference is is you actually need to run this command, which adds this line grub underscore platforms equals EFI dash 64. It writes that to the make.conf file and then you need to emerge the grub to bootloader. And Grub has finally finished emerging. That took about an hour and 20 minutes to emerge Grub. A very long time. So when I said earlier that, you know, after a little over two hours, I quit trying to compile the, uh, the generic kernel, the big kernel, and I thought maybe the virtual machine was hung up. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it's just really slow at compiling some of this stuff because I, I did not expect a, a grub to really take that long to emerge and we're really not through with the grub install because we still have to run the actual grub dash install command on our device on most machines that's going to be at slash dev slash sda of course inside this virtual machine the device is vda so let me run grub dash install space slash dev slash vda and it says installation finished no error reported 
once again, just for sake of completeness, that was for me doing a legacy boot BIOS. Those of you doing EFI instead of the grub install and then the path to the device, you would do grub install dash dash target equals x86 underscore 64 dash EFI and then give it the dash dash EFI dash directory equals slash boot flag. And now that we've run grub dash install, the last thing is to actually create a grub config file. So we need to run grub dash mk config for make config. So let me clear the screen here because this is a very important command. Let's make sure we get this right. So it's grub dash mk config space dash o space and then slash boot slash grub slash grub dot cfg. And at this point, we could go ahead and reboot the machine, but let's exit. So let's go ahead and do that. Exit. And then what we want to do is CD. And then we want to unmount. So run umount for unmount space dash L. And we're going to unmount slash MNT slash Gen2 slash dev. And then inside the braces here, I'm going to put slash SHM comma slash PTS comma and then U mount space dash capital R slash MNT slash Gen2. And then finally, let's go ahead and reboot. So let's go ahead and, and see if the machine reboots. All right, we get a grub menu. So our installation is completed. It worked. Thank you. And we get some init system information. So yeah, OpenRC is working. We get some networking information. It looks like the networking is working. Let's go ahead and make sure though we have to log in. Right now, all we have is a root user. So vert-gen2 was my host name. It says vert-gen2 login. So what user do we want to log in as? Of course, root is the only one. Now I need to enter our strong and complicated password. I hope I remember what I'd set for the password. Okay, and now we're actually logged in as root. So let's go back to the documentation. And the last chapter is finalizing. And really, the only thing left is to add a actual user that's not root. So you need some other user other than root on the system. And you need to use the user add command. And let me go ahead and just show you guys this here. Let me clear the screen. We're going to type user add dash lowercase m space dash capital G. And then we need to add this user to some groups. I'm going to add the user to users comma wheel comma wheel is the most important because that adds it to the sudoers group. We also need comma audio comma video. Uh, no spaces between these commas, by the way. Uh, some other groups that you probably want your home user to be a part of. CD-ROM, you may want him to be a part of floppy, you may want him to be a part of games. I think right now that may be all I need. One more, I should probably add USB. That probably covers most of the groups. So then space dash S, and this is for the shell. We want the default user shell to be slash bin slash bash. And then finally space and then the name of that user. I'm going to call my user DT. And it says the group games does not exist. So let me go ahead and up arrow. I'm going to remove the games group. I was actually looking at the documentation for groups to add and games was actually listed there. But let me up arrow and just remove games from the group list. And now we've created the DT user. Now the DT user needs a pass. So do pass WD DT. And now choose a password for the DT user. So let me create a strong and complicated password for the DT user. Again, you have to follow the rules for Gen 2. So 8 to 40 characters and uppercase, lowercase, no dictionary words. So now that we've set that password, let me try to log in to the DT user. So SU DT for switch user to DT. And uh, it just allowed us to do that because we were already the root user. The root user can do anything. And I think that's where I'm going to quit with this portion of the installation, because honestly, that's the end of the installation guide. Where do you go from here on this final page? Uh, well, where you go from here is whatever you want to do. Is this going to be a server? Is this going to be an actual desktop? You know, do you actually want a graphical environment? So if you want to actually have it as a desktop computer, obviously you're going to have to install XORG, right? The X11 display server. And then you're going to have to put a desktop environment or 
window manager on top of that. You're probably going to want a login manager. Where you go from here is a million different paths. You know, everybody's going to do something different. So I'm not going to do that on camera uh, for two reasons, because everybody will want something different. But the other reason I'm not going to do it is because it's going to take hours, especially if you guys wanted to see me install the full GNOME desktop environment or the full KDE Plasma desktop environment. It's very easy. You just emerge those desktop environments. The problem is it's going to take hours. Like if I had to install full GNOME or full KDE Plasma, it literally would take probably as many hours as I've already put in to this point just to install those packages. I'm not going to do that. Maybe in the future, I'll do some kind of minimal install. We'll do Xorg and maybe a really minimal window manager. I don't know, something like DWM, which you don't even have to bother emerging because DWM, you just go grab the source code from suckless.org and you manage that stuff yourself. What I suggest you guys do is try to, if you're gonna be a Gen 2 user, stay minimal because it takes so long to compile this software. Updates also take forever. You don't want a, a really big, heavy, bloated desktop environment. Stay light. Do window manager only. Also, if there's binary packages available for a program, use it because it'll save you from compiling. For example, many Gen 2 users don't compile the web browser. That's another thing. If I had to compile Chrome or uh, Firefox, they would take hours, many, many hours. There's binary packages available for the web browser. Install those. Same thing with the full LibreOffice suite. Don't compile that thing. There's a, a binary for LibreOffice. Install that instead. So right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and just leave this VM as is. I may clone it a couple of times and we may come back to it at some point. And again, maybe I'll throw Xorg on it and, and a window manager. If I do, of course, I'll do that on camera and share it with you guys. Now, before I go, I need to thank a few special people. I need to thank the producers of this episode. I'm talking about Absy, James, Gabe, Mitchell, Wes, Akami, Alan, Chuck, Kurt, David, Dylan, Gregory, Erjan, Alexander, Paul, Polytech, Scott, Steven, Sven, and Willie. These guys, they're my highest tiered patrons over on Patreon. Without these guys, I couldn't have spent all morning, all afternoon, and all evening compiling Gentoo today. I couldn't have done it. <laughs> the show is also brought to you by each and every one of these ladies and gentlemen as well. All these names you're seeing on the screen right now. I sincerely appreciate each and every one of these ladies and gentlemen, their support, because I don't have any corporate sponsors. I'm sponsored by you guys, the community. If you like my work and want to support me, please consider subscribing to DistroTube over on Patreon. All right. Peace. After all that, if I rebooted and didn't get a grub screen, I probably would have punched my monitor.